Davis, Dickinson, Donnelly, Ing, Fior, Fletcher, Fong, Fuentes, Furtani, Galgiani, Garrick, Gatto, Gordon, Garrell, Grove, Hagman, Halderman, Hall, Harkey, Hayashi, Hernandez, Hill, Huber, Weso, Huffman, Jeffries, Jones, Knight, Lara, Logue, Lowenthal, Ma, Mansour, Mendoza, Miller, Mitchell, Monning, Morell, Nestande, Nielsen, Norby, Olson, Pan, Perea, V. Manuel Perez, Portentino, Silva, Skinner, Smythe, Solorio, Swanson, Torres, Valadeo, Wagner, Wykowski, Williams, Yamada, Mr. Speaker.
A quorum is present. We ask our guests and visitors in the rear of the chamber and in the gallery to please stand for the prayer. We ask our assembly chaplain, Father Constantine Papadimos, to offer the day's prayer. Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, when David faced Goliath, all he had were a, sl a slingshot and five stones. He could have thought, I don't stand a chance, but he knew that he had you on his side and that ordinary stones would be exactly what he needed. Lord, with you on our side, all things are possible. Help us to focus on you and what you can do in our life, for you have extraordinary things planned for us. Amen. We ask our guests and visitors to remain standing and join us for the flag salute. Please join Assemblymember Huffman as he leads us in the pledge. Mr. Huffman. You may be seated. Reading of the previous day's journal. Assembly Chamber Sacramento, Wednesday, April 6, 2011. The Assembly met at 7 hour. Honorable Mike Gatto, Assistant P Speaker Pro Tem of the Assembly, Presiding Chief Clerk E. Dustin Wilson at the desk, reading Clerk Timothy Moreland, reading the roll was called. The Shaji and Alejo, Allen, Armiano, Atkins, Bell, Berry Hill, Block, Bloomingfield, Bonilla, Bradford, Brownlee, Buchanan, Butler, Calderon, Campos, Carter, Cedillo, Conway, Cook, Davis, Dickinson, Donnelly, Ying, Fuhrer, Fletcher, Fong, Fuentes, Furutani, Gaggiani, Garrett, Gatto, Gordon, Grove, Hagman, Halderman, Hall, Harkey, Hayashi, Hernandez, Hill, Huber, Hueso, Huffman, Jeffries, Jones, Knight, Lara, Logue, Lowenthal, Mal, Mendoza, Mansour, Mendoza, Miller, Mitchell, Monning, Morell, the Standing, Nielsen, Norby, Olson, Pan, Perea, V. Manuel, Perez, Silva, Solorio, Swanson, Torres, Valadeo, Wagner, Wykowski, Williams, Yamada, Mr. Speaker. The following communications are presented by the Speaker in order to print it in a journal. Theodore Dawson, please be advised that I have appointed Assemblymember Wilmer, Wilmer Mina Carter, Assemblymember Anthony Porrentino to the Assembly Transportation Committee for Monday, April 4th, hearing only. Dear Dawson, please be advised that I have appointed Assemblymember Betsy Butler to, to replace Assembly Isidore Hall on the Assembly Human Resource Human Services Committee for Tuesday, April 5th, hearing only. Dear Dawson, please be advised that I have appointed Assemblymember Steve Knight to replace Assemblymember Cameron Smythe to the Assembly Health Committee for Tuesday, April 5th, hearing only. Dear Dawson, please be advised that I have appointed Assemblymember Jim Silva to replace Assemblymember Jeff Grell on the Assembly Jud Judiciary Committee for Tuesday, April 5th, hearing only. Dear Dawson, please be advised that I have appointed Assemblymember Martin Garrick to replace Assemblymember Jeff Grell on the Assembly Utility Commerce and for Utilities, Commerce, and Committee for today's hearing only. Dear Dawson, please be advised I have appointed Assemblymember Wilmer Mina Carter to replace Assemblymember Nancy Skinner on the Assembly Utilities and Commerce Committee for today's hearing only. Dear Dawson, please be advised I have appointed Assemblymember Brian Estandy to replace Cameron Smythe on the Assembly Business Professions and Consumer Protection Committee for Tuesday, April 5th, hearing only. Dear Dawson, the encloses our official fiscal analysis of the ratified memorandum of understanding with the State Employees Bargaining Unit 9, Professional Engineers in the California Government, and Unit 10, California Association of Professional Scientists. This analysis is required to be submitted to the legislature pursuant to Section 1918. 9.5 of the government code is transmitted electronically to legislative staff on April 1st, 2011. Sincerely, Mac Tigger. Mr. Calderon moves and Mr. Hagman seconds that the reading of the previous day's journal be dispensed with. Presentations of petitions, there are none. Introductions and reference of bills will be deferred. Reports of committees will be deemed read and amendments deemed adopted. Messages from the governor, there are none. Messages from the Senate, there are none. Motions and resolutions. The absences for the day will be deemed read and printed in the journal. Mr. Allen, you are recognized. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, I request unanimous consent to suspend Assembly Rule 45.5 to allow Assembly Members Beale and Yamada to have guests and photographers on the floor. Without objection. Yes. Um, Request unanimous consent to suspend Assembly Rule uh, 118 to allow Assembly Member Butler to have a guest at her desk and a photographer on the floor. Without objection. Request unanimous consent to suspend Assembly Rule 45.5 to al allow Assembly Members Davis, Fuhr, Knight, and Mansoor to speak on adjourn in memory today. Without objection. <clears throat> Pursuant to Rule 96, request unanimous consent to refer bills to committee AB 427. John Perez from the Governmental Organization Committee to the Transportation Committee. Without objection. <clears throat> this one last one. Yeah, at H. F file item ACR 30, uh, it's being referred to the inactive file. Okay. 
Without objection, clerk will note. Okay, we have some guests here today. Guests, Mr. Hagman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I just want to announce I have a, a, my fourth grade class from Howard Carroll Elementary School and Chino Valley Unified School District up in the red. I just want to say hi to them and visit us, visit us today. Thank you. Mr. Calderon. It's, uh, awesome, Madam Speaker. Members, uh, um, I, I move um, pursuant to Rule 97 to uh, refer Item 59, AJR 2, to the Rules Committee. Without objection. Okay, Ms. Yamada, your guest, please. Okay. Members, please focus your attention to the speaker's desk in the back of the chamber. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, I have an abundance of riches today with constituents visiting me from a variety of cities in my district, and uh, I will be introducing uh, some students later on. But I'd like to ask all of you to turn your attention now to two a very special constituents of mine from the 8th Assembly District, both of whom were uh, instrumental in the Green Bay Packers 2011 Super Bowl win. Desmond, uh, and uh, Desmond Bishop and Jarrett Bush uh, have been uh, my homegrown heroes. And I'm very pleased that they and their families were able to join us today. For those of us who many times participate more in political football than uh, NFL football, this is particularly important to me today. This is only uh, the second time that someone from Solano County has uh, participated in a Super Bowl win. And it's the first time that two uh, young men from my district, one from Vacaville, as I say, uh, Jarrett, and uh, one from Fairfield, uh, Desmond, uh, have uh, participated in, uh, in this kind of activity. And I'm very, very proud of both of them, not only because of their on-the-field participation, but more importantly because of their off-the-field participation. They have uh, each come back uh, to their hometowns to do football camps with underprivileged youth. But let me, if I may, just take a moment to indulge. Uh, Desmond was, uh, it, is the, amassed a team leading eight tackles and a critical fumble recovery down the stretch of the fourth quarter of the game. Now, how many of you in here watch the game, may I ask? Okay. All right. And Jarrett racked up five tackles, one pass deflection, a quarterback hurry, and a key interception in the second quarter that actually led to the ultimate victory. As I said, both players are a great source of pride to the people of California and their hometown communities of Fairfield and Vacaville. And um, I would just say that many times uh, sports figures, you know, we dwell upon their accomplishments uh, in that arena and sometimes unfortunately are drawn to uh, some of the maybe not so nice things that some of our sports figures uh, engage in. But I can tell you that these two young men, who are each 26 years old, have a long future ahead, not only as athletes, but as uh, role models for their communities. And it is just with great, great pleasure that I am uh, able to bring them both to you today. Now, we've been waiting a couple of months. I think the Super Bowl was February the 6th, and it's now April the 7th. But um, I can tell you one of the reasons is that we wanted both of them to be here t together today. I believe they were uh, teammates, uh, they were, before they were teammates, they played against each other at times, right? Uh, uh, Will Seawood and Fairfield High. So now they've uh, joined forces uh, for good, and uh, I look forward to many more years of working with them 
uh, to bring honor to the 8th Assembly District, to themselves, and also to the at-risk youth of the 8th Assembly District. Please join me in welcoming Jarrett Bush and Desmond Bishop. Thank you. Ms. Yamada. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you again, members. I just wanted to let you know that uh, for those of you who will have time to join us for a brief reception in room 317 uh, immediately after uh, this portion of the ceremony, and I especially want to ta thank uh, Myra and Ian Blair of my staff for helping put this all together today. Thank you again, members. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Business on the daily file, second reading, clerk will read. This will be bill 807, 365, 6255 with amendments, 85 with amendments, 189 with amendments, 483, 540 with amendments, 167, 783 with amendments, 224 with amendments, 208 with amendments, 44, 65, 84, 123, 186, 194, 293, 298, 300, 324, 376, 606 with amendments, 313 with amendments, 41, 61, 82, 141, 169, 180, 188, 220, 272, 288, 337, 397, 458, 633, 1394, and Senate Bill 90 with amendments. All bills will be read and amendments deemed adopted. Mr. Calderon. Right, we need to take the uh, monument of 113 up for second reading. Oh, you... All right, so you don't have you don't have the monument bill itself. I was understanding. All right. All right, Madam Speaker, members, I request unanimous consent to allow Mr. Monty to take up SB 90 without reference to file for purpose of third reading today. Without objection. <laughs> Mr. Monning. This is on SB 90. Yes, clerk will read. Senate Bill 90 by Senator Steiberg, an act relating to health and making an appropriation therefore and declaring an urgency thereof to take effect immediately. Mr. Monning, you may open. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Members, we're going to be hearing two bills on the floor today, SB 90 and AB 113. They're a joint package uh, that is going to have immediate benefits for not only the state budget, but for district hospitals and children's health in this budget year, and then we'll lay the foundation for similar uh, gains in the next budget year. Senate Bill 90 is authored by President Pro Tem Steinberg. As I said, it's part of the two-bill package. And uh, California hospitals will expect to receive, Madam Speaker. California hospitals can expect to receive almost $940 million during this budget year. 
2010-11, and the state can expect to receive $500 million to help maintain health care services for children. There are three parts to SB 90, a six-month extension of the existing hospital quality assurance fee. This is sometimes known as the provider fee. Uh, we need the six-month extension to access federal money through the end of this budget year. Mr. Bonning, excuse me. Um, there's a lot of chatter in the back of the gallery. If we could keep the noise to a minimum. Thank you, Mr. Bonning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The second component relates to the general fund relief and children's health care coverage. Hospitals have agreed to share the revenues to help maintain critical health programs for children. It's $500 million over the two fiscal years. Some of these new funds will make up for lost savings related to successful litigation to block some of last year's effort in the budget to freeze hospital rates. Some of these funds will be realized now. The rest, including $320 million, will come when we pass subsequent legislation to extend the hospital fee for the budget year. The third component is the hospital seismic compliance extension component. This has been the most controversial element in the bill, but has minimal fiscal implications. It authorizes the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, OSHPED, to provide hospitals with an extension of up to seven years to help them comply with the state seismic safety law. This extension is not automatic. It allows for application hospital by hospital and would be measured on the following criteria the structural integrity of the hospital building, community access to services, including emergency services, if the hospital building were to close, and the financial capacity of the hospital to complete their construction project. In other words, they have to show a financial plan and financing. It cannot be speculative. Finally, this provision is contingent on passage of legislation extending the hospital fee for the 2011-12 fiscal year. In other words, this option to apply for extension does not become operational until we pass a 2011-12 uh, hospital fee provision. This legislation must be passed as quickly as possible to ensure that we are positioned to maximize every additional federal dollar that we can between now and June 30th. We hope to get federal approval by the end of this month, which will give us about 60 days to complete the mechanics of collecting the fees, matching the funds, and providing the supplemental payments. It's a lot of hard work. We need to get started now. The health of our children in the state is dependent upon it, and I urge your aye vote. Mr. Hagman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, and just for the Republican caucus, I just want to point out the analysis is the last packet or the last page in our packet so, but this is a wharf but it was still already in their analysis packet thank you mr blumenfield thank you uh this wanted to rise in support of this bill sb 90 these are budget related bills the urgency measure along with assembly member monning's ab 113 which is back for concurrence are part of a package of bills that allows the state to maximize potential federal funds for hospitals and children's health care coverage for the state budget, these bills will provide almost $940 million in net benefits to hospitals in this current fiscal year. Also, there'd be around $500 million made available for health care services uh, for children in the current year and in the budget year. As Assemblymember Monig noted, there'll be a limited extension of deadlines for hospital seismic safety improvement, improvements, but unlike other extensions, the hospitals have to meet specific criteria to qualify. Uh, it's, the urgency measure is no joke on this. In order to get this to, to work, there are a lot of moving parts that have to happen very quickly. I urge your uh, I vote for this important measure. Mr. Amiano. Uh, thank you very, very much. And uh, I need to commend uh, Mr. Monning, of course, the pro tem, uh, in forging this agreement. Um, I'm, I'm not going to support it, and I want to explain my vote. I really, really... Um, uh, uh, appreciate the art of a deal. It looks like great bi bipartisan dynamic here, which is something we could all learn from. Um, I know we need the money, and I know there's some very good intent in this bill. 
However, I am very concerned that what happened in Japan should sensitize us more to what language should be, extensions, etc. This is my feeling. I understand the feeling of the caucus and the speaker and why we're at this point. Believe me, I've been around a long time. But I'm not going to support this bill today. Uh, I hope that in the future uh, we can have further talks about uh, acts of God and how they should affect what we do here in, in Sacramento in regard to a state catastrophe. So thank you very much. Mr. Logue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I believe I support this bill. This bill is all around good. It is good for the state, it's good for the budget, good for hospitals, and good for the taxpayers. Hospitals are in full support of this fee because they will know that it will bring in federal money they benefit from. Objections made to the seismic safety portion of this bill are dishonest. Hospital safety is still a primary objective of the state law. This bill will simply make it easier for hospitals to come into compliance rather than being penalized for what they cannot control. I fully support SB 90 and urge my colleagues to vote yes. Mr. Chesbro. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I have several problems with this bill. Uh, first of all, I feel jammed by the fact that it's showing up on the floor wharfed like this. Uh, it's a complicated issue. Uh, I have always been a supporter of retrofitting our hospitals. The last place in town you want to fall down in an earthquake is the hospital. Now, I have a great, great deal of confidence in our Health Committee Chair, Mr. Monning, and I would like to have the time to look at this bill carefully and determine whether I'm satisfied making my own decision uh, that, in fact, the assurances he's given us are, are, uh, are there and that it's not simply a, a broad uh, 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 relief to the hospitals to, uh, of the responsibility to make their, their uh, hospitals safe. Uh, but in the absence of a little bit of time uh, to look at it, I can't vote for it. Ms. Harkey. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, this was heard in the policy committee as well as appropriation, received unanimous support. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for the seismic retrofit, which I won't go into right now, but that uh, Tri-Cities Memorial in Oceanside is one of those hospitals that has been having trouble getting the bonding, it needs the time, and either they get, either they get this extension, it's basically a time extension, or in fact they shut it down. And it is one of the few hospitals that takes in patients from all walks of life. Uh, it's, it's a, a district hospital and, the, and they need to keep this facility open. It's very, uh, they're going through the processes now so it just allows them a little more time so they don't have to close a very, very important hospital. And I think that's what our hospitals are facing. Um, it's not that they're not safe, they're retrofitting and they're in the processes of. Um, the other part of the bill uh, gets money to fill the gap in what we did or will be doing in our budget or have passed in our budget to where, where we need to go with another program and we can't be throwing, um, uh, we can't just di disfund or unfund some of, these, uh, some of these programs because they are going to be picked up by the federal government which is why we decided to handle them the way that we did in the budget committee. That being said, there is a gap and we need to fill that. So I would appreciate support for this measure. I think it's very sound. It's soundly crafted and it, it, it saves us money and helps some of our elderly as well as keeps the hospitals open that are functioning with full staffs, full, full, uh, ocup full occupancy, and we really need to keep them around. Thank you. Seeing no further questions or debate, Mr. Monning, you may close. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. Uh, as has been pointed out, this bill did go through policy committees, extensive questioning in both uh, Assembly Health and Assembly Appropriations uh, yesterday and the day before. The urgency is real. The urgency is are we going to capture federal money to support children's health programs, to support our district hospitals, and I believe on I, I appreciate the concerns of my colleagues focused on the seismic safety. Let me just remind you, these are not automatic extensions. In my view and in my conversations with OSHPED, this is going to give us absolutely more scrutiny on a hospital-by-hospital -hospital basis. As a member of the California Seismic Safety Commission, I am very concerned 
about hospital safety. This is going to give OSHPED more tools to scrutinize hospitals on a case-by-case -case basis, first and foremost on structural safety. The goal is to improve hospital safety. This bill provides a pathway to do it. I urge your I vote. Thank you. Clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 64, noes 3 on the urgency. Ayes 64, noes 3 on the measure. Measure passes. Okay, we have a couple more guests here today. Ms. Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to introduce a, a very good friend of mine um, that I met while I was on the City Council um, and Mayor of City of, of Pomona. Uh, from the City of Sunnyvale, I, have, I am very pleased to present to you uh, Council Member uh, Tony Spignoli. Thank you for being with us today. Ms. Butler, would you like to announce your guests? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. You're so cute. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to have my mother with me here today. She is a Sacramentan. As most of you know, I was born and raised here. She. She's a constituent of Dr. Of Dr. Pan's. Um, she also worked for the California Teachers Association for 34 years, so she's a big, strong advocate of our teachers. And my sister from Boise, Idaho, is also visiting, so thank you. Okay, we're going to go to business on the daily file, third reading, file item 52, AB 455, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 455 by Assembly Member Compost, an act relating to public employment. Ms. Compost. Thank you, Madam Speaker. AB 455 will ensure equal representation in the workplace. This, this bill will designate one half of the membership of a personnel or merit commission to be appointed, to, to be appointed by the public agency employer and the other half to be nominated by the recognized employee organization and appointed by the public agency employer. Once the commission is formed, it will jointly elect an additional member who shall act as a chairperson of the commission. Currently, there is unequal representation in the formation of a personnel or merit commission. Having one organization appoint the entire membership of a commission can skew the findings, benefiting one group over another, thus taking away the value of the commission. By enhancing local uniformity, this bill will further empower local jurisdictions. This bill is supported by various organizations. Um, members, I would like to reiterate this is a simple bill allowing four bipartisan commissions. Uh, I thank you for your time and respectfully ask for your I vote. Seeing no further questions or debate, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. <clears throat> Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes, ayes 41, noes 23, measure passes. File item 57, AB 746 on the amendments. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 746 with amendments by Assembly Member Campos. Ms. Campos. Good morning, Madam Chair and speakers and members. Today I am presenting amendments to AB 746, a simple bill to update our existing law on cyberbullying to include social network. 
Cyberbullying is the use of electronic devices and information to send or post harmful messages or images about individuals or a group. The amendments are technical and clarifying. They add the words necessarily to the phrase including but not necessarily limited, limited to. The amendments also um, add co-authors. AB 746 is supported by law enforcement and educators. There is no opposition to this bill or the amendments. I thank you and respect, respectfully ask for your I vote on adoption of the amendments. Thank you. Mr. Norby. I respect my colleague's concern about the safety of school kids. She has, she's a mother, I'm a father. None of us want our kids to be assaulted on a school campus. Uh, there are current laws against that, both criminal laws and school policy, without adding additional laws. I'm also concerned, before we rush to approve more bullying legislation, that we define exactly what bullying is. I'm reading from a bullying booklet published by the California Edu Department of Education, which describes bullying as acts that involve a real or perceived imbalance of power including name-calling, spreading rumors, manipulating social relationships, and social exclusion. That's a lot of things that go on right here on the floor, a lot of things that are necessary in politics. One person's rumors, another person's essential inside information. And with definitions this broad and all-encompassing, I think we have to define them properly before we rush into more legislation, which is unneeded, and can lead us down pathways which will limit our own freedom of speech. Seeing no further questions or debate, Ms. Campos, you may close. I respectfully ask for my colleagues I vote. Thank you. Um, okay, is there any objection to a voice vote? Okay, we're going to take a voice vote on these amendments. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, Mr. Norby, strike the roll. Mr. Norby requests an I, um, a roll call vote on these amendments. Okay, we're going to open the roll on these amendments. On these amendments, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. It's a majority of those present in voting. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 48, noes 13, ayes 49, noes 13. Amendments are adopted. Amendments are adopted, out to print, and back on file. We have uh, some other guests here. Ms. Yamada. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I'd like to welcome students from the California Children in the Field, Students Organizing for Progress, up in the gallery. They are high school juniors and seniors from Dixon High School in Maine Prairie High School in Dixon. And with them is one of their, uh, their supporters, Brandon Louie. And he, they, this is their first trip to the Capitol, I believe, and they're going to have a tour later today. I just want to say bienvenidos a uh, este casa de la gente, uh, the Estatal de California. This is your house. Welcome, and I hope you have a good day. Thank you. File item 63, AB 621, Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 621 by Assemblyman Charles Calderon, an act relating to vehicle rental agreements. Mr. Calderon. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, members, this is a measure that moved off the floor last year. Um, 
and it was uh, vetoed by the governor, but it takes care of a very real problem. When, when we have visitors from other countries, they come uh, into California and they rent cars. Uh, they also buy insurance. Well, when they get in an accident uh, and go back to their country, uh, there's no way to access the insurance uh, for the innocent third party. There's no way to access the insurance uh, without giving notice to that international resident. So what this bill would do, and unless you give notice, you can't go against the policy. So what this bill would do is it would simply um, uh, make the uh, car rental company, in cases where they issue a policy, and a policy is in existence, uh, be able to receive process. So it would allow innocent third parties to be able to go against only the limits of that insurance and nothing else. Um, and, and that's essentially what it does. It protects California residents. It does not uh, affect rights of um, international tourists or visitors. Um, and it takes advantage of a policy that was already entered into for that specific purpose. So I ask for an I vote. Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I rise briefly in opposition to the bill and want to explain uh, a, a little bit about uh, some of the trouble that we, uh, we, we find, or I certainly find, with the bill. Um, at this point, it is clear that under existing law, in particular its Vehicle Code Section uh, 17451, the director of the DMV uh, is specifically under state law authorized to accept service of process for non-resident drivers. Uh, there is a procedure in the law. It is unnecessary uh, to pass this law, and it will have uh, a couple of uh, unfortunate effects, one of which is potentially this bill runs afoul of U.S. law and federal treaty obligations. There is a treaty to which the United States is a signatory. It is the Hague Service Convention. It provides for a orderly process it is agreement among nations, an orderly process by which nationals uh, of one signatory state to the Hague Convention can serve uh, nationals of another uh, signatory to the Hague Convention. And what we do here is certainly seems to me to somewhat run afoul of the Hague Convention. Again, no real need for this since under the vehicle code and uh, treaty obligation in the United States. We've got a procedure to solve the problems that the bill is attempting to address. Uh, there was a request made at, in the uh, Judiciary Committee that an amendment be taken to resolve at least one of these objections, and that is uh, exempt out nationals of other Hague Convention countries, and f that amendment was not uh, taken. The, the um, provision remains that uh, seems to me in some ways to run afoul of U.S. treaty obligations. And uh, finally, I would like to add that although the bill itself limits the damages to which a um, national of a foreign state can be subject for whatever action they get served with uh, pursuant to this bill, the fact remains that once a defendant is in a United States court subject to United States jurisdiction, Conceivably, they are now opened to lawsuit, any other lawsuit uh, that someone may have or think they have against that national. And under those circumstances, I see we can, uh, it seems to me we will be opening up our courtrooms uh, in ways that, number one, we don't necessarily want to do um, in response to a very small bill like this. And number two, that uh, in a budget time where our courts are strapped, uh, may also be something we don't want to do. So in conclusion, this appears to me to be a fix to a problem that is non-existent and is otherwise addressed in uh, several procedures and will have some unintended consequences. For those reasons, I would urge a, not, a, a no vote. Thank you. Seeing no further questions or debate, Mr. Calderon, you may close. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, members. Well, uh, Mr. Wagner is correct. There is a way to um, uh, serve process on out-of-state drivers through DMV, but that law also requires service to be 
made on the individual um, out-of-state resident. So we're still back in the same boat. And the Hague Convention uh, is timely, time-consuming. It's not always um, sure that there's going to be, um, uh, you know, process uh, is going to be approved under that convention. And meanwhile, you've got a third party, innocent, just driving maybe to school, driving the kids to school, gets hit by a tourist. The tourist leaves thinking, well, there's coverage, insurance coverage. And yet, this person is sitting there needing to have medical services and can't get them. Now, this bill limits uh, liability only to the limits of the policy, and uh, it only requires the rental company to, make, to give notification um, at the last known address of the renter. And um, this seems like an eminently reasonable thing to do. Uh, and the only reason that I think to oppose this is that it will cost insurance companies money. Well, that's a risk that they take into account when they, when they issue these policies. And hopefully, they don't take into account that this is a moneymaker because they know that their insured will never ever be able to be served, uh, pro uh, the process will never be able to be served. So um, it's an eminently, it's a limited bill. It relates only to international renters, international residents. And it's only up to the policy limits of a policy that is in place and has been paid for and does not place any more liability on the car rental company. I ask for an I vote. Clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 42, noes 25, measure passes. Okay, we're waiting for one bill to come over from the Senate. In the meantime, we have four requests to adjourn in memory. The following members were approved to, um, to give a request in memory today. Mr. Davis, Mr. Fior, Mr. Knight, and Mr. Mansour. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, it is with the uh, immense sadness and deep sense of loss that I rise to ask for an adjourn in the memory of Ms. Cornelia Lorraine Robinson, who was a civil rights activist, uh, active in many organizations in her community over many years. She was born February 2nd, 1926 in Alexandria, Louisiana, and eventually uh, after having attend, uh, attended Wiley College in Marshall, Texas, she uh, married and moved to eventually Los Angeles. And she is the mother of one of our small business women of the year, Dr. Pam Wiley, who is a pathologist and works with young children uh, in Los Angeles. And as we adjourn today, we adjourn uh, on behalf of the memory of Mrs. Robinson, who through her life uh, with her three children uh, she um, had moved to Sacramento in her lifetime uh, and recently, after having taken ill, uh, started to live with her daughter prior to her passing in Los Angeles. And so we are proud of the example that she led over a lifetime of fighting for justice for others. And through her work, each of her children are outstanding and, and, and uh, outstanding and uh, productive citizens uh, helping to improve the quality of life because of the example she set. And so, Madam Speaker and members, uh, I thank you for this opportunity to put on the record our appreciation for the life led by Cornelia Lorraine Robinson. Mr. Fuhr. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to adjourn in memory of my friend John Adler. John was the husband of my wife's law school housemate. He, he was a very proficient lawyer who, like many of us, 
decided that public service was what mattered most. And so he expressed it through his service first on the Cherry Hill Town Council, then for 17 years in the New Jersey State Senate where he chaired the Judiciary Committee. He ran during those years a couple times for Congress in a district which many of us would call sort of a swing district. It was a predominantly Republican district and he lost a couple times, retained his Senate seat. And then in 2008, when President Obama won, so did John. And so he went to Congress. We, on our last legislative trip to Washington uh, about a year and a half ago, I broke away from the pack for a lunch meeting with John. He very proudly showed me the space on his office floor where he slept because he couldn't afford, like many members of Congress, to maintain two households discussed with me with great pride how he shaved and showered in the congressional gym. Uh, and we went to lunch, as would be typical of John, in the cafeteria, where all the staff members came by and said hi to him. He loved serving in Congress. A uh, very brilliant and marvelous guy. And then, in 2010, when Republicans took the House, John's seat, that very questionable seat, went to a Republican, so he served one term. He lost by just a handful of votes. Uh, John was a very active and healthy guy. Played tennis just a few weeks ago, doing great. Then he contracted an infection, and suddenly he died. John is survived by his wife, Shelley. And his four children from elementary school to college. He was 51. He was 51 years old. I ask that we adjourn in his memory. Mr. Knight. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I rise to adjourn in the memory of Sharon Thorson. Sharon Thorson was uh, one of ours. She became a staffer during the Ronald Reagan administration and worked here in the building for 30 years. She was the longest staffer working for one of our assembly members, assembly member uh, Phil Wyman, and then became the staffer of my father, Senator Pete Knight, for eight years. Uh, Sharon Thorson passed away recently with her uh, bout of cancer and she was uh, 70 years old in Yuma, Arizona and I ask that you keep her in your thoughts and prayers. Mr. Mansour. Thank you, Ma Thank you Madam Speaker. I rise today with a, a sad heart to adjourn in the memory of a longtime Orange County resident, uh, Mary Jo Hammett. Mary Jo and her husband, Jack Hammett, who was a former mayor of Costa Mesa, are both Pearl Harbor survivors. Uh, after the, the attacks, Mary Jo returned to the mainland and became immediately engaged in wartime employment as a messenger and later as a machinist in the local shipyards. Mary Jo was a devoted wife, a loving mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. She was also an avid bowler, a knitter, and a gardener, and she touched the lives of many and will be greatly missed by all. Uh, I, I knew Mary Jo just a little bit, having met her a couple times, um, but she was suffering from Alzheimer's, so I, you know, it was uh, obviously very difficult to get to know someone in that condition, but her husband, Jack, was by her side the whole time. But what is most amazing to me is that the two of them were married for 71 years. I join my colleagues from Orange County to adjourn in the memory of an amazing individual and someone that we will never forget. Thank you. Thank you, members. Please bring the names to the desk to be printed in the journal. We're still waiting for one bill to come over from the Senate. The session schedule is as follows. Friday, April 8th, no floor session, no check-in session. 
Monday, April 11th, floor session at 12 noon. Tuesday, April 12th, check-in session. Wednesday, April 13th, check-in session. Thursday, April 14th, floor session at 9 a.m. Spring recess begins upon adjournment. Friday, April 15th, recess. Monday, April 18th through Friday, April 22nd, recess. Monday, April 25th, floor session at 12 noon. Tuesday, April 26th, check-in session. Wednesday, April 27th, check-in session. Thursday, April 28th, floor session at 9 a.m. Friday, April 29th, floor session. No floor session, no check-in session. And Monday, May 2nd, floor session at 10 a.m. Please note the earlier time for floor session on Monday, May 2nd. Floor ses session will begin at 10 a.m. Mr. Bell, you have guests today. Mr. Bell. Members, please direct your attention to the rear of the chamber to the speaker's desk. Madam Speaker and members, um, today we uh, are celebrating uh, the National Tartan Day. Uh, and we have with us today the Caledonian Club of Sacramento in helping us recognize uh, our National Tartan Day. This uh, Caledonian Club is a nonprofit organization that is formed for the preservation of Scottish heritage, culture, and traditions. Now, from the framers of the United States Declaration of Independence to the first man on the moon, Scottish Americans have contributed mightily to the success of America. Recently, uh, my family found a, uh, uh, a note in the Oliver Cromwell's journals, and it said, and I quote, a clan of giants were captured in the Battle of Dunbar and sent to the colonies as slaves. And that's how my family came to America. <laughs> um, so I guess Oliver Cromwell didn't want us around. I hope uh, we, we don't have that happen here. Since its uh, formal recognition in 1997, National Tartan Day has grown in cultural and political significance, and our Caledonian Club here in Sacramento stands as a symbol of our nation's roots, maintaining a tradition as an active member of our local diverse community we have. I encourage all Californians to participate in the full range of cultural events that celebrate contributions made by Scots to the foundation, character, and prosperity of our country and state. Thank you. And we have a presentation from our Caledonian Club here. Mr. Dickinson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I want to uh, thank Assemblymember Bell and join him in recognizing the Caledonian Club of, of Sacramento in celebration of National Tartan Day, which actually was yesterday, April, April 6th. But that's OK. We can just keep celebrating, right, all year long. Uh, National Tartan Day uh, honors and celebrates Scottish culture and the role it's played in the development of, of the United States. And the Caledonian Club, which was established in 1876, is a nonprofit organization formed to preserve Scottish heritage, culture, and, and traditions. Now, you should know, because this is something you'll all want to take advantage of, that membership in the Caledonian Club provides countless hours of volunteer time to, to help run many activities, and it's open to anyone of Scottish birth or descent, their kin, or importantly, underscore this, to any person interested in the, in the rich and historic traditions of Scotland. The uh, signature event of uh, the Sacramento Valley uh, Caledonian Club is the Scottish Games and Festival. Uh, each year draws uh, up to 20,000 people, and this year it will be held May 7th and 8th at the Yolo County Fairgrounds uh, in Woodland. So I want to, on behalf of the Caledonian Club of Sacramento and all my colleagues in the Sacramento 
region cordially invite you to, to attend and enjoy, because you will enjoy, the Scottish Games and Festival coming up in, in just a, a couple of weeks. Thank you. Dr. Pam. Yes, I too want to uh, join my colleagues, uh, Mr. Bell and Dickinson, in recognizing the Caledonia Club and to celebrate National Tartan Day. Uh, it's, certainly, it's uh, great having um, Caledonia Club in my district, and uh, the, the, the traditions and heritage of the Scottish people are ones that I think are great guides for us as we move forward in policy here in the state of California. So again, I want to thank them for being here, and I want to again, thank Assemblymember Bell for recognizing them, and uh, again, also join in with uh, my colleague, Member Dickinson, in welcoming people to uh, participate in their activities. So thank you. Mr. Bell. Yes, thank you. And I think in a, a moment we're going to bring some um, pipes in. Uh, now that we have a little uh, time waiting for the Senate, we might as well pipe uh, the Senate resolution over to the Assembly. Ms. Yamada. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I apologize for speaking so much today on the floor, but. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Bell if uh, the Caledonian Club brought any haggis with them today. <laughs> well, um, I don't think today um, our um, service in the Capitol will include that. However, it can be arranged. Um, and I don't want to describe what uh, in is included in a haggis. Mr. Bell. Uh, we ask permission to uh, pipe in uh, the Senate resolution uh, or a, a bill while we're waiting. Without objection.
Okay, member, so as soon as the bill comes back from the Senate, there will be a health committee meeting off the floor, and then we will return to vote for the bill.
Okay, members, the Senate is taking up AB 113 right now. Looks like it's passed. So if they send it over immediately, then we should get the bill over here within five to 10 minutes.
Mr. Calderon. Yes, Madam Speaker and members, uh, pursuant to Rule 77.2, uh, requesting Adams consent to refer uh, AB 113 to the Health Committee. Without objection. All right. And now the Health Committee is meeting now in the Rules Committee room. Off the floor. Okay, without objection, the Health Committee will now meet in the Rules Committee room. Health Committee. Off the floor.
Mr. Calderon. <coughs> yes, Madam and Speaker, um, I request the announced consent to waive the one-day waiting rule and to take up um, AB 113 without reference to file for purposes of concurrence. Mr. Calderon, we need to accept the committee oh, report okay. first. Without objection, the committee report will be deemed read and adopted. Now, Mr. Calderon. And, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, request unanimous consent to waive the one-day uh, waiting rule and to take up uh, AB 113 without reference to file for purposes of concurrence. Without objection. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 113 by Assembly Member Mo Monning, an act relating to health, declaring an urgency, making an appropriation therefore, and declaring an urgency thereof to take effect immediately. Mr. Monning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. I want to thank you for your patience. Uh, we've just moved this out of the Assembly Health Committee. AB 113 is one of the two bill package. We spoke earlier about SB 90, authored by Senator Steinberg. These bills are urgently needed to enable us to take advantage of an increase in federal funds that are available in the Medi-Cal programs. AB 113 is particularly significant because it will bring essential and necessary funding to district hospitals throughout the state of California. This bill allows district hospitals to use local revenues to bring in up to $33 million in additional federal funds each year by establishing what is known as an intergovernmental transfer. Local hospital districts will transfer funds to the state through the Medi-Cal program and double those contributions by receiving matching federal funds. The total package is estimated to increase the savings to the general fund by a minimum of $50 million in the current budget year and over $300 million in the 2011-12 budget year. Uh, the Senate, as you know, has passed this off the floor. It has just cleared our Assembly Health Committee, and I urge your aye vote. Seeing no further questions or debate, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. I-64 knows one on the urgency. I-64 knows one on the measure. Measure passes. Senate amendments are concurred in. I'm ready to entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Calderon moves, Mr. Hagman seconds that this House stands adjourned until Monday, April 11th at 12 noon. Quorum call is lifted. Vote change. Hayashi of SB 90 from I to No. Hayashi, Senate Bill 90, I to No. Vote change, Gatto, Senate Bill 90, I to No. Gatto, Senate Bill 90, I to No.